Hey guys, my name is Radek. I'm your TA for Economics 1 BO3, and this is my video about Chapter 13. And it's something to do with the costs of production. So let's jump right in. The objective of a firm is to maximize profits. Duh. Profits are not the same as revenue, though. Revenue is what the firm makes in total, while profits are what the firm makes minus their total costs of operating. Kind of confusing. So what is total revenue? I hate telemarketers. All right, so mathematically, total revenue is price times quantity, right? So you are selling a product. Say you're selling pizzas. One pizza costs $10. In a day, you sell 20 pizzas. You have $200. Is that profit? No, that's not profit. That is revenue. Profit is what you make after all your expenses are covered. So the price of dough, the price of sauce, the price of cheese, the price of pepperoni, right? So you subtract your costs and then you have your profit. So what are costs? Mathematically, total cost is the marginal cost times the quantity. So mathematical profit is total revenue minus total costs. Now I mentioned this thing about marginal cost. We will cover that and we will see what marginal cost actually is. Now in economics, it is not simply costs. We have implicit costs and we have explicit costs. The theory behind it the first time you go through it is a little bit confusing, but you know what, it gets easier as we go along. So I'm going to go through what an implicit cost is. This may be confusing, but bear with me. An implicit cost is a cost that is represented by a lost opportunity and the use of a company's own resources. Keep that in mind, it is the lost opportunity. Um, an implicit cost is also sometimes called an imputed cost, an implied cost, or a uh, notional cost. And that's the opportunity cost. And it is what a firm must give up in order to use factors which it neither purchases nor hires. It is the opposite of an explicit cost, which is born directly. An explicit cost is born directly. In other words, an implicit cost is any cost that results from using an asset instead of renting, selling, or lending it. The term also applies for foregone income from choosing not to work. So say that you have a lawnmower. You can either choose to mow people's lawns or you can choose to rent it out, right? So economic profit could be zero. Say that you have one person that you can lend the lawnmower out to for $5, or you have one person that you can mow their lawn. You can't do both, right? You can either mow that person's lawn for $5 or lend your mower to another person for $5. Well, when you take the foregone opportunity of renting that mower and you choose to mow the, per the other person's lawn, you're still at an economic profit of zero, but your accounting profit is actually five, right? Let's say that your dad bought the lawnmower and he paid for the gas. So your economic profit is five. There's no cost. So what is an explicit cost? An explicit cost is a direct payment made to others in the course of running a business, such as wage, rent, or materials. Explicit costs are taken into account along with implicit ones when considering economic profit. Accounting profit only takes into account explicit costs. The term profit has two related but distinct meanings. You have economic profit, which is the total revenue minus total costs, including both explicit and implicit costs. And then accounting profit is the total revenue minus total explicit costs. So now that we've made that very clear, let's move on to the production function. A production function is a relationship between the inputs required to make a good and the actual output of the good. In the scope of introductory economics, it is a table that lists inputs, the quantity of inputs, the cost per input, and the cost per, or, and then the output. In general, when we look at a production function table, not the graph, but the table, uh, do, 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 um, where am I? Yes, when we look at a production function table, we see the number of employed as labor. Then we have output, also known as quantity. And then we have the marginal product, our fixed costs, our variable costs, and our total costs. So what are each of these? Well, labor, it's simple. It's the quantity of workers you have employed. Output is the product of labor. It's what, it's at the end of the day, what did your laborers do? Marginal product is the incremental change of output when we employ one additional product unit of labor. So marginal product, let's take a step back, is the incremental change of output when we employ one additional unit of labor. Say you own a pizza place. You got Tony making pizza. He makes one pizza every hour. You know what? It's not good enough. You hire Marcello. 
he starts making another pizza an hour. So as we changed labor by one, our marginal product was also one. So let's stay with this pizza place example. You've got Luigi. He's making 10 pizzas an hour. That's fine. You hire Marcello. He only makes one, or let's say he makes two pizzas an hour. The marginal product that changed was two. As you went from one guy to another, the product only increased by two. Man, I'm getting an Italian accent saying these names. Alright, but we'll come back to that. We'll also see the problem with, with the first guy making ten pizzas and the second guy only making two pizzas. We'll see what the problem with that is and why the other guy might not be an idiot, he might not be incompetent, but there might be other factors only allowing him to make an extra two pizzas an hour. All right, so fixed costs are those such as rent or let's say hourly wage when you don't have overtime. Um, other fixed costs could be could be telephone expenses, say you have, you got to use a phone, right, and say you're not making any long distance calls, so every month your phone bill is $30, or well, let's say you have unlimited internet, right, that could be another fixed cost. Let's say you have advertising, and you advertise the same, another fixed cost, it's anything that doesn't change, right, depending on how much you're making, but we'll explore that as well. Uh, fixed costs do not vary with the quantity. Uh, da, 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 da. Total cost is the fixed cost plus the variable cost. So what are variable costs? It's anything that does change with the amount of quantity you produce, right? So say you have piecework. You work at a machine shop and you have piecework. If one guy only makes one product, he gets a wage according. Say he, does, he produces two pieces, he will get a wage according. Say he makes three pieces, that will be according. Another, another thing with variable cost is you have a guy making all these widgets. The variable cost is the amount of input. So say the widgets are made of wood. The more widgets this guy makes, the more wood you have to use. Therefore, your variable costs are increasing. So, what are total costs? Well, total costs are simply the variable costs plus the fixed costs. Fis fixed costs, as I said before, do not vary with the quantity of output, but variable costs do vary according to the quantity of output. Not too hard. So when we graph the production function, it shows us the relationship between output and the quantity of workers. Why is this important? Well, because it usually shows us when the marginal product begins to decline and this is known as a diminishing marginal product. Mathematically, we would describe this function as increasing at a decreasing rate. So why don't I just draw what increasing at a decreasing rate means. Basically, it's a function that looks like this. It's an S. It's increasing, but it is increasing at a decreasing rate. Somewhere around here, that is where the slope is the steepest. Over here, it's declining. So, average total cost, average fixed cost, and average variable cost. The key word is average. So we know what total cost is, we know what average cost is, and we know what variable costs are. So, Average total cost is basically total cost divided by quantity. We know what fixed costs are, and so fixed, average fixed cost is fixed cost divided by quantity. And, well, the same thing goes for the average variable cost. So four points. Average variable cost curve starts from a height and goes on declining continuously as, product increase, as production increases. The average variable cost curve the average, the average cost curve and the marginal cost curve start from a height and reach minimum points, then rise sharply and continuously. The average fixed cost curve approaches zero asymptotically. The average variable cost curve is never parallel as or as high as the average cost curve due to the existence of positive average fixed costs at all levels of production. But the average variable cost curve asymptotically approaches the average cost curve from below. Last point. 
The marginal cost curve always passes through the, through the minimum points of the average variable cost and average cost curves, uh, average total cost curves. Though the average variable cost curve attains a minimum point prior to the average total cost curve. And I will draw this out and I will show you how to draw this properly because you will see a couple of, uh, couple of questions. So let me make a few extra points. So the average cost will always be downward sloping because the fixed cost doesn't change. As our output increases, the average fixed cost will keep going down. So now suppose you are an artist and you buy a marker to do your masterpiece and let's say your parents give you the paper, right? So you're only dealing with the cost of the marker. The marker costs you a buck. The first masterpiece you draw is an average fixed cost of a dollar. So that one masterpiece that you drew, the only cost you incurred was the pen or the, the marker, which cost you a dollar. So now suppose you draw two masterpieces. The average cost that you incurred was 50 cents per masterpiece. Two masterpiece, one dollar for the marker. Say you draw 10 masterpieces, the marker costs you 10 cents per masterpiece. So that's basically what an average fixed cost is. Average total cost and average variable costs reach a minimum and then start going up, as this may be a part of a reason um, such as overtime. The portions of the curve where you have ABC and ATC are rising is due to the fact that output is rising and the costs are spread over a large number of units. On the other side of the, of the curve, it starts to increase, and this is because average costs are increasing as output increases. So a question that is usually presented to students on a test, um, and a lot of students get this wrong, is when the marginal cost curve is at a minimum, what is happening to the average total cost and average variable cost? Is it increasing or decreasing? So the easiest way to draw this, when you see this on a test, this question. First step, draw your x and y axes. Second step, draw your marginal cost curve. And the marginal cost curve is easy to remember. It looks like a check mark. So you're going to get this question right. Next, the biggest problem students have with drawing this is getting the average total cost and average variable cost curves to have a minimum point intersecting the marginal cost curve. So the way I draw this, first I draw it like this, one side. Then I draw the other side. And therefore, the minimum is intersecting with the marginal cost curve. And as we know, the first one is average variable cost. I'm going to do the same thing. And the top one is average total cost. So now, the question was, when marginal cost is at a minimum, what happens to ABC and ATC. So this point is when marginal cost is at a minimum. The slope is zero. I drew a dashed line. So now we see when marginal cost is at a minimum, average, average variable cost and average total cost are decreasing. So when you see a question like this on a quiz, a test, or an exam, you will know the answer. The question again was when marginal cost curve is at a minimum, what is happening to ABC and ATC? So a question that is usually presented to students, another question that they usually get wrong is after MC and ABC are equal, what is happening to the average variable cost from there on? So when MC equals ABC, what is happening? Well, when they're equal, they're intersecting. And we see that at this point, ABC will be increasing. The same question can be posed for ATC. After MC and ATC are equal, what is happening to ATC? It is increasing. You guys can thank me for uh, giving you those marks later. So the last thing I want to touch upon is economies of scale, diseconomies of scale, and constant returns to scale. This part you will have had to have read the chapter to understand what I'm saying. And you should have read all the other chapters as well, if you're on chapter 13. Well, 
all the ones before chapter 13. All right, when we look at the outside envelope of a set of average total cost curves in the short run, we see a downward sloping portion at the beginning where we see the economies of scale, the flat portion in the middle where we see constant returns of scale, and the last third is where we see the diseconomies of scale. So economies of scale refers to the cost advantage that a business obtains due to expansion. There are factors that cause a producer's average cost per unit to fall as the scale of output increases. Economies of scale is a long-run concept and refers to the reduction in unit cost as the size of a facility and the usage levels of other inputs increase. The common source of economies of scale is purchasing in bulk and, let's say, technological advancements or even people specializing, right? So economies of scale also is derived partially from learning by doing. People get better at what they do. So the long run average cost, the LRAC, of production, so each of the factors reduces the long run average cost of production by shifting the short run average cost curve down and to the right. So now what's this economies of scale? Well simply, this economies of scale is where average total cost rises as quantity increases. So remember when we had our pizza pie example, our pizza shop example, when the first guy was making 10 pizzas, then you hired the next guy, and all of a sudden they're only making 12 pizzas in total? You would have expected them to be making 20, no? Well, let's say that you have a really small pizza place, and the kitchen's only big enough for one guy. One guy working, he'll make 10 pizzas. Two guys, well, they'll start, start getting in the way of each other, and their marginal product will decrease. It doesn't mean that the first guy's still making 10 pizzas, and the second guy's only making two pizzas, it means that their average product is only six pizzas. So they're getting in each other's way, they don't have enough, and that's why they're only making 12 pizzas instead of 20. Now, constant returns to scale is where the long run average cost remains constant in certain quantities. You'll have to look at the book to see what I mean, but it makes sense if you've read the book. So that's where I'm gonna stop right now. This was chapter 13. My name's Radic, and remember these are my notes and my interpretation of the chapter, you still have to go to class and you still have to read the book to know what's going on. All right, guys, see you in chapter 14.